was a little problem with my slides, so we'll wait a couple of minutes. Um, in the meantime, I will tell you a little bit about uh, you know our background. Uh, I'm the founder of Trady. We started the company about two years and a half ago, and since then uh, I have been very um, focused on understanding what reputation is, uh, what you know, how can we define it, and how can we measure it uh, in a way that is uh, effective, efficient, s fair, safe, etc. Uh, when I hear about people defining reputation, uh, lately, especially in the sharing economy, we have heard things like uh, it's a currency or it's an asset. Uh, my belief is that it's neither of those, and I'm going to explain what I believe reputation is. Uh, I can explain why I don't think it is a currency or an asset, because if I give you a dollar, I don't have a dollar anymore. However, if I give you reputation, I still have my reputation. So you can argue that it's an asset that always increases, or it's an asset that you don't lose when you give away. Uh, at the same time, if I give you that dollar, or Bill Gates gives you a dollar, that dollar is worth the same amount, which is the value of one dollar. However, if I, I give you reputation, I recommend you for something, or Bill Gates recommends you for something, clearly one, <laughs> one of them has more power than the other. So it's, it's difficult to measure it as a currency or as an asset. Uh, and I think that we'll have a, oh, thank you. Um, I'll try to put a framework that I think that works better than that, and then I will, m I will uh, suggest what I think that are going to be the challenges or the debates for the next 10 years. So what is reputation then? Uh, let me start from the most uh, fundamental and sociological point of view. So think about hundreds of years ago, 300, 400 years ago, when we were working in very small villages, in very small towns with very few people, you would buy the same cheese, the same meat, from the same exact people every single day. If one day the butcher would give you bad meat, you would stop going to that place. Not only that, all the people around you in the town would know about that, and that butcher would have to either you know, move towns or go somewhere else or, or rebuild his reputation. So there were very what we call closed networks, in which everyone would find out very quickly about what was going on. This is what I show here. Um, oh, I don't know if this is working. Sorry, is, it, is this working? No? Sorry, let's see if we can fix this. <laughs> oh, no, it's fine now. OK. Um, so in a closed network, if you have a bad actor, that bad actor is going to be reflected very quickly, and it's going everyone in the network is going to learn about that, that, that bad actor. That's the reason as well why if you have a group of friends and somebody commits some kind of you know, a bad act on you, very quickly your friends learn about that, and that friend has to leave. Happens with couples when, they, you know, when a, a couple breaks up, usually friends have to stay with one friend, either, either leaves or stays with their own friends. That's what we call a closed network. However, today we work more in open networks. We don't know everyone. So when a bad act happens, uh, only our friends are going to learn about that bad act. Everyone else in the network doesn't learn about it. And what that means is that we lose control, we lose uh, safety, because you know, that, that person could commit that fraud with us and could commit that fraud with somebody else. Um, the, the way we fix this in an open network is through third parties. Third parties are brands, basically. So. When you hire a consultant, you're not looking at the consultant himself or herself. You're looking at McKinsey. You're looking at the, number, at, at the company of the brand. Uh, when you have a lawyer, if the lawyer is the lawyer of Apple, you know that it's probably a good lawyer. Or if you have a doctor and that doctor comes from Harvard, that's you, the, the doctor gets the extri extrinsic edu uh, reputation from Harvard, from the brand. Uh, Visa is a slightly different case because what you're getting is uh, the insurance of Visa. As a merchant, I don't care about whether you, you have money in your visa or not. I care about the fact that by paying with visa, I know I will eventually get paid. So I don't even need to trust you. That's how we fix things today. Um, now, uh, what has happened uh, between this, uh, in this change uh, is a tremendous sociological cha uh, change of, over, the next, uh, over, the over the last 200 years, from very small networks, closed networks, into open networks. Now, what happens is um, that this is what we call, um, sorry, I cannot read from here, is efficient mechanism of social control. Uh, and, that, and that's because what reputation really is, is it helps us 
to have a, a safe society, a, a controlled society, a place where we can trust one another. Now, um, the, what we have defined in, in within treaty are two axes for reputation. What, one of them is more intrinsic and the other one is extrinsic, or what we say, history and endorsement. When you have history, um, so when you, when you don't have neither history or, 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 or endorsement, you cannot know if you can trust one person. If you have endorsement, like in the case of Harvard, you know that you have that extrinsic reputation that whereby you can be trusted. Or I in, the case of, um, in the case of Visa, as I mentioned, you don't even have to trust the person. You just trust the brand, and Visa is going to take, take, a, uh, take, a, uh, take care of you. When you don't have uh, endorsement, but you have history, like in the case of those closed networks, what you, are in, what you are trusting is that history, is that those previous transactions. And of course, in the case of relationships, like my own mother, I don't need to have any kind of uh, trust issues with my mother because we have a very long history of transactions, even if they are not monetary, they are a relationship. Of course, the good, happen, the good things happen when you have both history and uh, an endorsement. That's when you can have full trust, that's when you have uh, big deals like private equity deals, uh, M&A deals, all sorts of big transactions that require a very high level of trust. That's why I if you realize uh, one of the um, uh, industries that has not been disrupted yet uh, is uh, investment banking. Investment banking is in that area, and it's going to be very difficult to disrupt simply because of the amount of trust that is required. And, th and that's the reason why Goldman Sachs and all those guys have so much power that they're keeping that uh, central point for the very high, large transactions. Um, so, of course, as we move into uh, technologies helping us do all sorts of transactions with strangers, you know, cars, uh, houses, uh, online dating, all sorts of things, it creates a new sociological change that's happening very quickly. As I said, we move from closed networks, very few people in small villages, to open networks, cities where we don't know each other, to now starting to work with anyone in the network, anyone being 7 billion people in the world. So we need uh, new mechanisms for this, and uh, so uh, or a new framework for reputation in order to, to see how we can work with, with one another, because brands are not taking place here. The brand might be the marketplace, but really you have to start to trust this guy, right? Um, what, when you look at uh, where reputation really matters, I mentioned Goldman Sachs earlier, uh, there are two dimensions in which you can think about uh, where it matters. Uh, within that, it has to do with uh, the value of the asset at risk, which is the horizontal ax axis, and the personal, uh, uh, the personal interaction at risk. So when, where you have low risk, it's going to be uh, when you're buying and selling things on eBay. The worst thing that could happen is that you lose the, oh, sorry. Where you can lose the, the product. On the, top, uh, on the top right corner, what you have is things like a doctor, a babysitter, a caretaker, etc. High value of the asset, what was the value of a baby, and high interaction with the person. So, I mean, a caretaker is, is very clear, right, or a doctor. So. Uh, th that area is where reputation really matters, and as I said, it has to do with those two dimensions. I would like to ask you very quickly, uh, now getting to what reputation really is, if you could choose between Anne and Beth to do a ride share from here to Brussels, who would you choose? You have Anne, who has five stars in whatever marketplace, call it Blablacar or whatever you want, um, for $11, or Beth, Three stars, nine dollars. Can I ask you who would go for Anne? Okay. Who would go for Beth? Okay, I, can, I think it would be about 10% of people would go for Beth um, and 90% of people would go for Anne. Okay, let's see what happens if I say Carol, okay? So le let's choose between Beth and Carol. Beth at nine dollars, Carol at 15 dollars. Who goes for Beth? Okay, and who goes for Carol? Okay, I think that this is more like 50-50. I guess that if I had um, Diane, and Diane was uh, $40, we would end up having 90% going for Beth, right? And maybe 10% would go with Diane. Now, what we are seeing here is that what we actually have is what I call a demand, um, a, a price elasticity of reputation. If you have studied economics, you know about the, the concept of price elasticity of demand. Right, which is uh, as as, uh, uh, as there is the more demand, the prices go down, go up, etc. Here we have that the price 
is going to be affected by the, by the reputation. It's, and it's a curve. We have done a lot of experiments, and it looks like a curve, exactly the same as the demand. This is the case of, as I mentioned earlier in the two dimensions, is the case of um, uh, history. Now look, let's look at the case of uh, endorsement. Let's look at Anne, who is going to be your doctor, and she studied at Harvard. No, repu no reputation from her, from her own, because it, she's a recent grad, she has never done any surgery, but she studied at Harvard, and she is going to cost $3,000. Or you can choose Beth, who studied at the Cat University, and or the Kitten University, and she costs $1,500 for some kind of surgery, maybe for you or maybe for your baby. Who will go for Anne? Okay, who will go for Beth? Okay, somebody, <laughs> like 1%. <laughs> um, uh, so what we have here, is, as I said, is the other dimension. So they don't have, neither Nan nor Beth have intrinsic reputation. They only have extrinsic reputation given by Harvard. You can argue that maybe with Harvard they will also learn something else, uh, or better, or from better professors. But here, we are just trusting the brand. And you are putting a, a, a price elasticity of $1,500 on the difference between the, the, the same surgery. Now let's go for a higher price. So now you have Beth at $1,500 or Carol at $20,000. Who goes for Beth? Okay. Who goes for Carol? Okay. Some people just cannot afford any of them, so <laughs> that's why we don't have all the hands. That's fine. Uh, but again, a price elasticity. There is a price elasticity of reputation. So when you're thinking about that, from the mathematical point of view, what you realize is that actually reputation can be defined as, op, as a risk premium. What you are paying for is the risk premium of Beth over Anne, or Anne over Beth. You are paying for that. You are paying for the premium. That's the only thing you are paying for. That's reputation. That's the best way to look at what reputation is, how can you measure it, and how can we uh, look at what, you know, how, how we can create frameworks around it in order to have a safe society or a controlled society. Uh, what we have learned over the last few years is that, as, uh, or the, as I said, over the last few years we have been doing this research, uh, is that as those networks are starting to become bigger and there are more and more marketplaces creating all sorts of connections between people, what we are creating is a network of trust. And the network of trust is uh, that, sociological, that sociological change, which is fundamental between going from very close networks to highly liquid ephemeral networks. Networks of people who transact once and they disappear. Uber, I transact once, I disappear, I leave a review. Halo, the same. Airbnb, the same. Blablacar, the same. You might argue that you can go with the same person to the next, to the to the, to the same city the following week. That's almost uh, you know by by chance, or it might be that you end up having making friends. But the reality is that you create ephemeral connections, ephemeral networks that happen only once and disappear. But the network stays. And the learning from this is that there are incredible applications for a network of trust, and it goes far beyond the individual reputation of the star rating. Uh, think about Mohammed Janus. Um, what he created was a network of trust in Bangladesh whereby he would give credit to people who, uh, this is a simplification, but let's, let's take it as, uh, for, for, uh, as an example. Uh, he would give credit to people who didn't have the means. What the, the only thing that they had as a collateral was the network of trust of the, of the other people in the community. Now, if that person did, would not return or would default on that credit or would not return the credit, the interest rate goes going to increase for everyone else in the community. Now imagine the peer pressure to return that, that to return that credit is tremendous. So the, the network the, the network of trust here acts as social control just because you don't want to defect not only on the person who gives you the credit, but on the people in the network who are going to be affected by your actions. The same happens with uh, another company in Germany, very interesting, French students. Uh, uh, what they do is groups of people come together to, to buy insurance. If you put some kind of claim on your car, it's going to affect the risk premium of all your friends. So what that means is that if you were alone, maybe you would claim some kind of scratch on your car. But if you have all these people in who are your friends and you're going to affect their price next year, you might just accept the scratch or not and, and not go out and, and request it to be to be fixed. So t network of trust, peer pressure, tremendous uh, uh, tremendous amount of power to have um, uh, to, to to build reputation, to build social control. Uh, another example: uh, the Amish in the U.S. Uh, you might know that for religion religious reasons, they are not allowed to buy insurance. 
uh, they cannot buy insurance in case that they, you know, that, that something would happen to them in health, some kind of cancer or anything. They cannot have insurance. However, they have a post insurance uh, whereby if somebody in the community has a, an illness, everyone else will chip in to s to pay for that uh, to pay for that uh, cure or say or or health or or whatever. So. Um, the reason why this works is because it's a very uh, strict, very close community of people, very, uh, very strong network of trust, whereby if you don't chip in into helping Johnny from the neighborhood, you're going to be excluded from the network. Very, very strong network of trust. Now, as I mentioned, the network of trust now is happening by itself, just from all these transactions that we do online with all sorts of people. And uh, we're aggregating all that, all that data into, into networks that are go far beyond uh, individuals, because what we get is that the vulnerability of a person is turning into the power or the or the or the strength of an of a, um, of a network. Now we're much stronger when we have things like French unions, like like Mohammed Yunus giving credits, like like the Amish helping each other. Uh, which takes us to the challenges. What are the challenges over the next ten years? The debates that we're going to have to face and to understand in order to have a safe or a safer society as we move from that sociological change of very close networks to tremendously ephemeral networks. Uh, I find two types of challenges, ethical and technical. And you will see that the ethical ones are more difficult than the, than the technical ones. From the ethical point of view, we have who owns your reputation. Um, you can argue that uh, you own your reputation, and that's very fair. The reality is that whatever you think about me right now belongs to you. I cannot change that. I cannot own that. Whatever you think this guy is an asshole, this guy, you know, I like his talk, I didn't like his talk, that's whatever you think about me. So you actually own that reputation. At the same time, is it fair that a marketplace like Airbnb, you can only use those star ratings within Airbnb and you cannot use them elsewhere? Didn't you earn that reputation? Cannot you use that elsewhere? If I earn my Harvard degree, can I not use that in, in, in anywhere else? Of course I do, right? So I own that reputation, but in a, in, a, in a very restricted manner because the people who look at that reputation are the ones deciding what they think about that reputation. Um, the right to forget and the right to delete. What happens if I was 14 years old and I, we have all these ephemeral networks and, and I, I commit some kind of small fraud on eBay? Is it going to affect me the, the rest of my life? Well, maybe it shouldn't, right? And we have seen that Google is now uh, you know, has been forced to, to have the, the give the people the ability to forget and, del and delete. But in the case of reputation, if I was allowed to delete all my negative reviews on eBay, what's the power, what's the value of that? If I, if, if I have, uh, which I takes me to the next um, uh, uh, challenge, which is the value of the negative uh, reputation. If you have 80 reviews on eBay, 79 of them being good and one of them being bad, what do you think people will do when they want to check you out? Of course, they go to the negative one. They want to find out what happened in that transaction, right? You all do the same. So negative transactions have a tremendous amount of value. They have mo a lot more value than positive transactions. Now, if we had the right to forget on the right to delete, I could just delete the bad one, I give the 79 good ones, and then what's the point of reputation at all, right? So this, these are ethical challenges. Technically, it's very easy. You just have a line on your code to delete or not delete. Ethically, we have to decide what, what is the right approach. Maybe it's a window of opportunity. Maybe it's five years that move with you and you just keep the last five years with you. you know, there, are, there are going to be many challenges that we have to face or that might be done uh, platform by platform. Uh, and finally, reputation versus curation on this side. So as you know, um, or as you might know, uh, drivers on, on Uber, if they go below 4.2 stars, they get curated out of the platform. However, on platforms like eBay, there's no curation. I can transact with people with 99% positive reviews, but if I want, I can also transact with people who have 78% good reviews. It's up to me. Yeah. So who should choose? Should I be able to choose? Or should the platform choose for me? Or should an algorithm choose for me? Uh, you know, in, when I go to freelancer.com, I get, you know, I can choose who I want to work with and there will be different prices. Should we have been forced to work with Anne? Or should we, should we have the ability to choose Anne or Beth depending on our price elasticities? Maybe I cannot afford $11, but I could afford $9. So there are many challenges there that, we ha that have to be faced and have to be discussed. And maybe they, they go platform by platform or maybe not. Uh, technical, criminals. Uh, I mentioned criminals uh, as, uh, I mentioned networks of trust. What if you could have 
a network of criminals who trust each other, they increase their ratings, and then you know, they're all you know, up for the grasp for any kind of fraud. So that's, that's one of the most challenging, criminal, uh, most challenging technical issues that have to be uh, assessed. And today they are done platform by platform, and we know that all, the, all these marketplaces are doing a great job. And you know, the blah, blah cars and Airbnbs, they have a tremendous, tremendous amount of people and resources into eliminating the bad people in the network. But this will happen eventually as we have more and more networks um, that are uh, aggregated from different uh, sources. Uh, people left out. This is one of the things I'm most uh, passionate about. Uh, let's say that my mother doesn't have neither eBay, Airbnb, Uber, or any of those things. Um, should she not be able to become part of the economic graph that the sharing economy or, any other or, or what's happening with, with technology is allowing us? Well, of course she should be. She's a trustworthy person. She just doesn't happen to have those reviews. Um, so how can we help those people who are neither digital or who are in remote locations where they have not been able to get started? Uh, so I think that this is a, a of tremendous importance because when you think about it, Airbnb, which we take as the largest you know, platform of uh, sharing economy and all that, they barely have 10 million users. That's nothing in a 7 billion people world. It's, it's nothing. It's a drop in the ocean. So we really have to be thinking about wh what happens with the people who are left out of the digital economic graph. Um, and finally, rating the rater. Of course, uh, that's another technical challenge. You can have, uh, you may have seen it, uh, you know, people on Yelp or TripAdvisor. You can have random people putting positive reviews, negative reviews about their competitors. That we have to find ways to rate the person who is rating, because the, it can be fraudulent, it can be uh, unfair, it can be they can be enemies. They can, there can be any reasons why those ratings could not be uh, could not be safe. Uh, so those are the challenges that I think we'll be facing over the next seven years. There may be more, and those are the ones we have identified for now. That's it really from me. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and now let's go for lunch. <laughs>